good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is for you. For me, it is precisely 12.25 p.m. Why do you need to know that? You do not. <laughs> uh, so let's just uh, move on. Uh, on to our next unit, ancient Mesopotamia and the first agricultural empires. And that word agricultural or agrarian empires, uh, they're sometimes called, uh, or that phrase, I should say, we, we might want to uh, keep in mind, uh, sort of keep that uh, in your memory banks. Uh, it's a term that will come up again. Either way, agricultural or agrarian empire means the same thing. What this is saying, uh, and Mesopotamia is the first example of this, we'll see many others, is that uh, the empires, really the kingdoms, countries, we're going to look at political units for the most part here, the rest of the way in this class are uh, this, agricultural empires, meaning that they're wealthy and powerful civilizations, uh, or again, kingdoms, empires, that uh, th their wealth and power at bottom uh, comes from a, a huge amount of uh, agricultural production. So we, we've kind of skipped uh, a large chunk of history in a way. So uh, we're going to go back in a second and kind of put the pieces together from where we've come, which is uh, prehistory, uh, to the doorstep of civilization, where we're uh, headed now. Uh, as uh, one uh, writer, uh, a good book uh, on Mesopotamia, uh, kind of a general uh, book, uh, good for college students, uh, it was here that the fundamental transition from hunting, gathering, to farming took place. Here also were the first templates, uh, uh, sorry, temples and cities, the first metalworking, the first writing, the first kingdoms, the first empires. The heartland of the ancient Near East was Mesopotamia, the fertile plains watered by the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. At different periods, uh, the power of the various Mesopotamian kingdoms extended far beyond the lowland plains. So first, Mesopotamia is the region that centers on, ironically, modern-day Iraq. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers are the two uh, big rivers, river systems in the region. If you remember, perhaps you don't, from our first unit, that where agriculture has appeared for the first time, and it apparently appeared here first in the entire world, uh, but it uh, almost always happens first uh, in a fertile river valley area. Here there's two uh, river valleys, uh, Tigris and Euphrates, uh, and we'll eventually look at, not too far away, Egypt uh, and uh, right, ancient Egypt and the Nile River in China and India. Uh, it's along the uh, river valleys in those uh, parts of the world that you see the first agricultural or agrarian empires rise up as well, where agriculture takes root first, and then the agricultural, I should say the urban agricultural way of life. So one of the things that's also, I think, misleading here, we should get out of the way to start with, is that urban and agricultural go together. So we're talking about agricultural empires, and another way to kind of say the same thing is we're talking about urban agricultural societies. I say it, it, it's a bit counterintuitive. Uh, it sounds wrong because we tend to think separate Right, urban from uh, uh, rural today in a sense of, well, you know, city life, and then there's farming out in the countryside in rural areas. True, but they're fundamentally linked, of course, because uh, we that live in cities uh, are relying on food that's grown or raised somewhere else out in the countryside uh, most of the time. So urban, agricultural, definitely go together. Remember, hunter-gatherers, for the most part, with the exceptions, did not build permanent villages, towns, and cities uh, because they were on the move. Uh, they didn't do farming. They had to chase the food around or chose to chase the food around uh, instead of uh, going the agricultural route. But once societies decide to move to agriculture, they start to then sort of settle in, build bigger and bigger structures, bigger and bigger, bigger urban areas from villages to towns to cities, and the, the whole way of life changes. Everything changes. The economy the uh, political system, you know, the value system, religion, on and on and on. And we did, I did hint at this in our first unit as well, but it bears some repeating. So let's go back, being that we're kind of already there, uh, to uh, prehistory uh, and uh, just take a, a simple sort of glance at sort of the trajectory here. 
So we started with hunter gatherers, you know, tens of or hundreds of thousands of years ago, and we came up to the doorstep of civilization because we went from the uh, the Paleolithic period to the Neolithic, uh, and the main change there was the change to farming, not everywhere at the same time in the world, but uh, that was the general direction. Approximately ten thousand to like seven thousand years ago, and it was a revolution indeed for the reasons that I just mentioned. We'll have a cause to look at that a little more depth and detail, not just in this unit, but in another of the ones that follow, since we'll be looking at, as I said, agricultural empires uh, for quite some time now. That that becomes sort of the model uh, type of, uh, of society. So uh, that once the move to farming is made, Neolithic revolution, for a long time, this is the part I said, moments ago that we've kind of skipped a number of thousand years from a, for about three to six thousand years farming was starting to develop and grow and permanent dwellings and villages were starting to grow uh, but for a long time farming was then just done kind of on a small scale people still lived in small communities you know, a, a village of dozens of, of people and not much more and it's sort of at the tail end of that, as that starts to evolve into you know, somewhat larger town or villages, then kind of into towns, which I think it was, I think, larger than a village, and then uh, small scale cities. Uh, and so it's in that interim period that we kind of skipped, uh, meaning that up until I just said that, it made it sound like we went from hunter gatherers uh, to small scale uh, farmers to gigantic civilizations and empires and you know, massive farming. Uh, there was an in-between phase of a few thousand years where uh, all this stuff was continuing to grow gradually. Oh, there was something I was going to say about the quote uh, beneath the picture. Uh, let's see. Uh, excuse me. I, I lost it. I, I, I can't remember. I might come back to it if I do. The million-dollar question. Why are political units getting larger during this period? Well, I think we already should know the answer to that question, at least in part. So go back into your memory, dig out the you know unit that we just finished uh, on prehistory, and the, the answers are kind of in there. But I'm going to give this away eventually anyway. Let's get our geographical bearings first, shall we? Uh, we are in the Fertile Crescent. By the way, historians uh, like myself only have one superpower, uh, but it's a good one. I can, I have the ability to, uh, with the snap of my fingers, to move us forward and backwards in time uh, by thousands of years and move us from one part of the globe to another with the snap of my fingers. Uh, we've now just gone from the United States, uh, right, to uh, Mesopotamia, uh, to Iraq, just like that. Uh, and we've moved back in uh, time thousands of years. That's a good superpower to have, is it not? Uh, so, uh, anyway, enough nonsense. Uh, the Fertile Crescent, here it is. If you don't know your uh, geography, uh, uh, this won't help. And the map doesn't really help that much anyway, since it's kind of zeroed in on one part of the world. This is now what we call the Middle East. In ancient history, it's usually referred to by historians uh, as the Near East, but same region. Uh, you can see why it's called the Fertile Crescent, this somewhat crescent-shaped. Uh, this is was an area that was quite fertile, and you can see the uh, tracing of the two river valleys, or rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. So why was it just in sort of a crescent shape that you have fertile territory and not so much outside of that? That's why. It pretty much accords with the you know the, the rivers going uh, through there. So we see within this uh, actually will become a number of kingdoms uh, for uh, certain times united, usually by force, but Sumer will start, Akkad uh, further to the north and west, uh, and further northwest still Assyria. So uh, Syria, Akkad, Sumer, I sort of said it backwards there, uh, we'll, we'll look at these. So the Fertile Crescent, uh, this is uh, right, uh, ancient Mesopotamia. So this whole region uh, is Mesop it was Mesopotamia. It's now, as it says on the map, Syria, Iraq, see Iran in there, Turkey to the uh, northwest, uh, just to give you a general sense of, of where we are in the world. So we're talking about the beginning of civilization. Right, we've built up again through uh, the, uh, the the thousands of years, sorry, of the Paleolithic period uh, through the Neolithic period. The move to farming, uh, small farming villages, uh, into farming towns and 
Now we're up to basically farming uh, empires, agrarian empires. So this brings us to civilizations. These are now the first civilizations. Since Mesopotamia was the first urban agricultural uh, society, uh, we could say this is the first civilization. We have to be a little bit careful with this word, however, because uh, at least in the past, it's been used in a way, right, coming from the root word civilized or civil, uh, there's been sort of a, a dichotomy where uh, peoples uh, have uh, judged other peoples, usually Europeans judging uh, other peoples that they conquered uh, much later in history than this, but before now, are now, uh, and saying, well, this group of people is civilized and they're over there, they're uncivilized, uh, and uh, which is a value judgment. It's basically saying we're superior uh, or this group is superior to that one over there. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of judgments and, of course, prejudice and racism in, in the idea originally. But uh, I think the word uh, still can be useful, and it's the title of our class anyway, so we are sort of stuck with it. Uh, we can sort of uh, stay away from uh, any kind of definition uh, that would have us uh, doing something as ridiculous as trying to sort of say one group of people is superior to another, which all of us know is not true. Uh, uh, it's just not true and it can be it's been proven in many different disciplines many different fields of study uh, which should be obvious anyway so uh, our definition of civilization isn't making value judgments uh, one way to look at it would be to say that civilization does mean that societies uh, that are moving in the direction of civilization are becoming uh, more complicated more complex their governing structures their economies are getting larger and require more organizational uh, you know, bureaucracy and such things, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're better, right? Uh, there's an argument to be made for the simple life being better. I mean, we hear that all the time. You can go to the bookstore or go on Amazon and find books about it. Uh, how to simplify your life and make it better. I mean, the idea is you'll be happier if you simplify. And there are plenty of people, even scholars, that think, for instance, Native Americans and other peoples that didn't sort of move uh, to sort of uh, along kind of the classic uh, route of civilization, which we see um, represented in, a, in tree form here, oddly enough, uh, on the right, uh, that some were, were happier, uh, their lives were happier. Civilization has made us uh, miserable, uh, and, and modern civilization, especially the modern world. Uh, I wouldn't argue that there isn't a, a lot of truth in that. Uh, our, our world is, is crazy in, in, in many ways. So uh, to say that we move to, or you know, any one group of people, here are the ancient Mesopotamians, uh, move to civilization does not require us to make a judgment call or a value judgment about peoples that aren't uh, living uh, in uh, civilization. Because the definition of civilization, uh, right, uh, really just means moving to the urban agricultural way of life, moving away from hunting and gathering, or uh, pastoralism. We didn't talk about it yet, but uh, sort of another way to live, uh, much like hunting gathering, but instead of hunting gathering per se, uh, and certainly instead of building cities and urban agricultural societies, uh, pastoralists uh, herd animals uh, and live uh, nomadically, you know, following or leading their herds around permanently. Uh, so uh, that's not sort of a, the definition of civilization because it's not at base urban agricultural uh, so uh, th they drew the tree here a little differently than i would uh, but you start with agriculture uh, and then i would put sort of in there again urban uh, life uh, but a, a food surplus comes out of this uh, in time one of the ways that things grow more complex part of the reason is just as the population grows you've got more mouths to feed so you better put more land under acreage you better figure out better farming techniques to increase crop yields so that you can sustain a growing population. Uh, there's new economic activities, new social classes, uh, and again, the, the political units start to get bigger, actually from city uh, to city-state. Sometimes that uh, step is skipped uh, to empire, which means conquering other cities and city-states and turning things into, putting things into larger sort of blocks, political blocks. Again, we go back to that million-dollar question, what's the advantage of doing all this? Uh, we'll come back to it. So civilization is sort of all these things. Kingdoms and empires, again, are the bigger and biggest political units we'll see in this class. 
technological advances, they take off in urban uh, uh, agricultural uh, centers uh, like uh, uh, the ones we're seeing here. And we will see in Egypt and other places in different parts of the, of the world. Why? Well, because with more people in one place, it makes sense to specialize. Hunter-gatherers, for the most part, weren't specialists. They uh, were jacks of all trades. There were a few specialists here and there. There were sometimes priests. Uh, they kind of a specialized, you know, that was their job. But for the most part, most hunter-gatherer groups, they all kind of pitched in and did a little of everything. Uh, I mean, some of them, you know, hunted and uh, others didn't, but it wasn't nearly as specialized as this. It didn't make it made more sense uh, for the community to thrive, to survive, to uh, sort of everybody pitch in uh, in a way they can. Here now it makes more sense uh, to specialize because you're so close to so many other people. Why do I want to like uh, you know go you know get my own food uh, if I'm a dentist? Uh, right? Uh, I don't want to be a dentist by day and then have to go out and, and, and hunt in the middle of the night. That'd be kind of hard. Uh, or on the weekends, go out and hunt for my food or farm. I'm a dentist. I don't want to do that. Uh, and I don't need to because I can I can use the you know money that I make from being a dentist. Not that they really had dentists uh, in the modern sense uh, in the ancient world. Well, they had something uh, uh, sort of equating uh, to it. But you, you see that in, in these kind of civilizations, when it's urban-based, it, it makes more sense to specialize. Uh, right? Uh, you... Uh, do what you do for a living, uh, your particular skill and profession, I do what I do, and we can kind of exchange goods and services and money so that uh, all you have to do uh, increasingly, and maybe not quite that far yet uh, in uh, Mesopotamia, around 3000 BC or so, but for the most part, it's you only have to know how to do one thing, uh, right? That's true of us right now. Uh, how do you uh, survive and get by and make a living and pay your rent or mortgage or for car payment, insurance, you know, internet, uh, whatever it might be? You have to do one thing, you have one job. I mean, some people have two and have more, but you know, if you have a decent enough paying job, uh, and most people going to college, like yourselves, are trying to have one career in one thing, something that they like uh, and or makes them a lot of money. Uh, and so, uh, right, that's why you do it uh, in part, so you don't have to do everything else. So I teach history. That's all I do. That's all I know how to do, uh, sadly. But I make uh, enough money to do that, uh, or doing that, that I can, everything else that I need, I can buy. I mean, if I don't do it around my house, which I'm not very good at anyway, uh, I, I can buy. I can buy my groceries, uh, right? I can buy services if I don't want to mow my lawn. Do, but if I don't, I could hire uh, someone to do it. So uh, we do one thing and have specialists and sort of we trade then goods and services and money around. This is the way of urban agricultural societies and uh, uh, civilizations. And we're very familiar with this, of course, because it's the direction that our, our world has more or less gone ever since. So here we can see though, the power of this uh, because why did it start so long ago and it still uh, exists today, this type of living with all the things on that tree, right? Specialization of labor at the top of the tree is what we're talking about, uh, right? Jobs divided up uh, and people are no longer generalists or jacks of all trades. You do one thing uh, and then, you know, use the money from that uh, to buy everything else. Uh, so this is still the case in our society right now. So why did it, how did it start so long ago and last? Well, that gets back to our million dollar question, of course. And uh, again, hopefully you already have some symbol of it's an answer sort of in your minds right now. It's selected in through the process of competition. Uh, remember cultural evolution. Uh, clearly this type of society had advantages over those that weren't uh, urban agricultural civilizations, uh, right? Partly they're just bigger. They have more people. They can field larger armies. They have a bigger economy, so they're richer. They have more people that, can, that are working the fields and own more land because it's a big, uh, again, kingdom or empire. So they have the advantages of size and resources and human resources uh, over their neighbors, over their hunter-gatherers or pastoralists, nomad uh, uh, peoples. Uh, and so these things start to spread because they can. Uh, they can uh, you know, overawe uh, just about sort of every other a type of uh, you know living organization uh, uh, around them, uh, and so they just dominate. Uh, 
whether it's fair uh, or not isn't the point. Whether it was nice to the peoples that they you know, overran is not the point. It wasn't nice. Uh, it was often extremely cruel and vicious. And we could say immoral today. Nonetheless, it is what happened, and it's the way the world has gone overall uh, ever since. So, uh, but conflict is on our tree, you see there as well. So this is uh, what happens uh, because uh, these, uh, the ones that thrive, uh, they tend to want to expand, partly because their population expands and they might eventually run out of ways to increase the food supply. So uh, let's just conquer more land, steal it from our neighbors by force, and then we'll have, uh, we can take their food. So uh, this happens as well. Uh, cultural diffusion uh, means, means that if this, Right, if this is a Mesopotamian city, ziggurat complex here in the lower left. Uh, but if that urban area, right, sort of attacks and takes over its uh, neighbors because they don't have the same model or they're not as far along, as big, not as powerful, not as economically uh, sophisticated, uh, militarily sophisticated, not as technologically sophisticated, they get swallowed up. Uh, and then this uh, group here, uh, right, to not only takes forces the other one under their wing politically, but they, in a sense, have their culture then diffused outward. Uh, their culture, you know, whether you know, the other people want it or not, are going to sort of get it. Uh, not necessarily at once, but over time, the culture right, diffusion uh, implies that it's taking place uh, gradually. Long distance trade uh, naturally kind of goes along with this uh, because uh, you can do long distance trade. It's beneficial since you can't always sort of make everything or have everything in the ground or as natural resources, uh, but they could be useful to you, then you take the surplus of things that you have more than you need, uh, for instance, crops, wheat or barley or whatever it might be, and you trade it for uh, iron or something that you may not have in the ground uh, nearby. So uh, in that sense, sort of everybody that's involved benefits to some degree. This all requires, of course, militaries, because the downside of being a very successful society or agrarian empire uh, is that people might start looking at your oh there's a lot of wealth there um, if we could take that down uh, invade it and conquer it uh, we'd have a lot uh, uh, sort of, of money and power on our hands so you become a target uh, in a sense uh, whether you're uh, powerful or not powerful if you're not powerful you're a target because they see you easy pickings if you are powerful and wealthy uh, that you're a target because uh, there's a lot to take uh, so it's not an easy uh, uh, you know, game in either way. Uh, but all these things then are part of what we call civilization. Now that's not to say that peoples that are hunter-gatherers that don't move to the first step of this, which is urban agricultural base, uh, don't have armies or militaries, uh, but they're not sort of the type of uh, large-scale organized armies. Uh, they tend to be uh, more of what we call warriors than soldiers, uh, and they have warriors. Uh, you know, they have their merits. Uh, they're often incredibly brave and incredibly strong, uh, and you know, adept with different types of weapons. Uh, but uh, they're not quite the same as armies in these type of civilizations. Uh, the armies that we're going to see, you know, Roman Empire, for instance, the Greek phalanxes, uh, and so on, uh, other parts of the world as well, are more organized, uh, meaning uh, it's less, it becomes less and less, this happens over time, but it becomes less and less important uh, uh, that you're sort of physically strong, not that it's unimportant uh, or skilled with a sword or whatever, and more important that you stick to the your job and you can sort of fight uh, uh, in a unit. Unit cohesion becomes important. So it's, it's less, as time goes on, what the individual can do individually in battle is less important than what the unit does sort of as a whole, their regiment, their, uh, uh, right, uh, uh, you know, whatever size, the you know, legion, Roman legion, uh, right, you all have a job and you have to do it kind of in coordination. Uh, so it's, uh, th this is different uh, in an urban agricultural civilization than it is in a hunter-gatherer a band or, 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 or village. The origins of the agrarian empires. Uh, so, right, uh, these are uh, hierarchical, uh, centralized uh, political, social, economic units and systems that produce, um, sorry, produce huge wealth through the great extent of their productive lands. So, again, this is why we call them agrarian empires. All their power militarily, their uh, 
grander in terms of you know the things the structures that they build architecture uh, all of the wealth and resources that they bring to bear uh, can bring to bear uh, ultimately comes from their uh, huge uh, agricultural uh, production uh, we see the establishment of a ruling class top-down rulers powerful new governing institutions uh, they become more and more bureaucratized I mean there's more structure uh, they're more systematically organized, kind of like a pyramid of power, to sort of corporate structure in the office. Everybody knows who's the boss and who's their boss and who's their boss. And so these things become more and more tightly organized as they become bigger and harder to, uh, you know, sort of uh, you know, keep control over unless they're very well organized. Uh, so top down uh, hierarchical systems, this is actually uh, really part of civilization, the definition of it as well. They tend not to be democratic, at least not until we get into the, the, the modern world. Certainly in the ancient world where we are now, uh, they're not democratic at all. They only work sort of through top-down. You know, so we'll, we'll see democratic systems as well in the ancient world, but they're an aberration. So it's not the, it's not the norm, certainly. Uh, there's a monopoly on violence uh, in these uh, new agrarian empires. Uh, as Ernest, Ernest Gellner, one of the great... Uh, scholars of uh, nations, uh, history of nations, says uh, discussion of the state, that means the government, uh, may begin with Max Weber's celebrated definition of it as that agency within society which possesses the monopoly of legitimate violence. Violence may be applied only by the central political authority and those to whom it delegates this right and nobody else. Uh, Max Weber was an extremely influential German scholar on the turn of the 20th century. I always tell students this, uh, if you've never heard of Max Weber, uh, and many may, may have not uh, so far, you will. If you stay in college long enough to get a, you know, a degree or more, uh, Max Weber will come up. Uh, and not just in history, uh, it could be sociology, in which he was one of the founding sort of thinkers. Uh, it could be in economics, uh, many other culture, uh, uh, many other uh, types of uh, subject classes. Max Weber's uh, ideas sort of uh, are still around, kind of still in the air. A lot of them are controversial, but uh, uh, he was a, a very capacious uh, scholar, uh, and so he still has something to say. Still gets quoted uh, as I'm quoting him, and Gellner is quoting him here. I asked the question at the bottom uh, again: Can the concept of cultural evolution, uh, with ideas Darwinian ideas like fitness, adaptation, selection? Uh, be used profitably here, and you know my answer uh, is yes. Uh, that uh, a culture, uh, which is a sort of a set of rules, a code uh, of rules, a blueprint uh, for uh, how to sort of behave, uh, how societies, sort of our society, this society, that society, is are, are supposed to do things to keep everything together and working, uh, right? Uh, uh, I think the cultural evolutionary approach and model uh, is quite useful, right? right? Fitness. Uh, is an agrarian empire fit uh, enough to survive and sort of weather the storms? Well, the big ones, uh, the ones that have all the attributes successfully in place that we've talked about and more, yes. In fact, they outcompete everybody else. So again, sort of looking at this from the perspective of you know evolution, uh, you can sort of see kind of like you know animals in Darwin's uh, sort of animal kingdom or individual organisms competing with each other for survival, you can sort of see different types of political organization kind of like they're competing for survival. I mean, they actually are. Uh, and uh, we can see from the experiment that history did for us that the agrarian empires won out. Uh, they basically run the table uh, and beat everybody else. So they have the, uh, uh, you know, the ability to out-compete uh, and out even adapt uh, any any other type of structure. The first group of people within Mesopotamia that we'll look at chronologically, and they're kind of the most important ones in our whole unit, are the Sumerians. We saw them on the map, located kind of in the southeastern portion of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, they made huge contributions to early civilization. Uh, so there's kind of two main things here. One. Uh, they sort of were the first to basically move to large-scale agriculture. They developed 12 uh, independent city-states. So within that one area, they kind of got subdivided into 12 city-states. A city-state, as we'll see, we'll see more of these things in other places too, is kind of like a smaller version of a, you know, uh, kind of an empire. 
or kingdom, uh, usually a city, an urban area with just enough farmland to kind of feed everyone in the urban area. Uh, you know, farming villages outside, but mostly uh, just enough land to feed everybody uh, in the urban center, which is the large scale, the largest part of the population. Uh, this is around 3000 BC. They uh, developed codes of law. They started making all kinds of uh, advances in agriculture, uh, improving irrigation to be able to do farming on a larger and larger scale, um, produced uh, different types of grain, uh, started doing metallurgy, metal production, sometimes on uh, on metals, uh, oftentimes uh, imported uh, through trade. Uh, technology uh, uh, took off bronze uh, uh, tools and weapons, which are stronger than what came before. Uh, right, uh, This uh, was a mixture of uh, of copper and tin, the 10 to 1 ratio, copper to uh, tin. Uh, so that, you know, who figured that out? First, of, the first and uh, we don't know, uh, but uh, it did produce uh, better weapons. So here's a good uh, place to stop and see an example of the kind of competition that goes on. Uh, right? So if uh, if you'd never knew what bronze was, you didn't know, maybe you knew what copper and tin were, but you never thought of combining them. You didn't know that it made for stronger, better weapons than uh, you know any others at the time. Uh, and you found out one of your neighbors, you know, once you realized what it could do uh, and did do, and you realized your neighboring empire had it and you didn't, you better acquire the technology and the resources to you know put it together, or you're in trouble. Because if they decide to attack you, they have far superior weapons. So again, always kind of a competitive pressure here uh, to keep up or stay ahead of the other side. Uh, and so it's always kind of ratcheting up the competition, uh, ratcheting up, ratcheting up the technology, the knowledge, the know-how uh, in many areas, including farming. There's a great deal of culture and learning that starts to happen in these places, also because, in part, there's a, a specialization uh, of craft and labor. So you get scholars and uh, doctors and lawyers, uh, great literature and art, uh, advances in medicine. And there's already a lunar, lunar calendar. So uh, these are all the kind of things that you come to expect when you start studying urban agricultural uh, well, civilizations. Uh, these things kind of just take off in that kind of urban in, in environment. That's not to say that the, the majority of the population is always living in the cities, but uh, most of the time, the big decisions and most of the resources, uh, and the political power, economic power is centered, centralized in the cities. The Sumerians are also historically significant for another reason, this is number two at the bottom, not in bold print for some reason, uh, but uh, even after the Sumerians were gone from the scene, they remained the basis of Mesopotamian culture and society uh, thereafter uh, through the period of the Babylonians, another group in the area that dominated for a time, the Assyrians, same thing, Phoenicians a little bit later on. Uh, long after the Sumerians disappeared, what we're, is what we're saying is that their culture, uh, right, their way of life, their values, uh, their knowledge, their learning uh, still was sort of the basis for these other groups that followed. But what do I mean by saying after they disappeared? Where did they go? Uh, did they just like wander off somewhere? Uh, no, uh, of course. The Sumerians didn't go extinct. They didn't move somewhere else. I'm sure some of them did. Uh, but what happened was uh, they started to uh, sort of mix with the other groups, uh, with the ones we see on the screen and, and others. So that eventually the Sumer as the Sumerians lost their political power uh, and got overrun by one uh, uh, sort of other uh, group, uh, you know, their civilization, their city-states eventually were taken over, uh, then they kind of lose their political status, they're subsumed by, uh, you know, this and that other more powerful groups, uh, they start intermarrying with those groups, and pretty soon no one's talking about, hey, there's a, there's a Sumerian over there, and uh, there's a Babylonian over there, uh, the, the, the culture that kind of lost uh, ends up kind of being talked about now as Babylonian culture, even though many of its traits, many of its cultural attributes are still uh, uh, Sumerian. Uh, so that's what we mean when we say uh, that the Sumerians remained, you know, right, to the sort of the, the, the core uh, of Mesopotamian culture, uh, even after the Mesopotamians themselves, as a group of people that we designate as such, the Sumerians are, are gone. Uh, so that's actually the mo most important, I think, contribution. Uh, the way their values and culture uh, were the backbone of all Mesopotamian culture, even after the heyday 
of their city-states and even after they faded from the scene. The next sort of stage sees the uh, Akkadians further to the north in the Fertile Crescent uh, dominates, uh, especially in, during the reign of the King Sargon or Sargon the Great, uh, now deceased uh, professor, anthropologist, uh, famous at the time, uh, decades ago, Elman Service, uh, in a classic work which deals with, uh, uses the concept, as you can see in the title of Cultural Evolution, says, beginning in the Akkadian times, or in Akkadian times, the political trend was toward ever larger territories that experienced, apparently, a slow development of the political, bureaucratic, and military means of control. Writing and mathematics continued to develop in connection with statecraft, while economics, law, religion, and ideology were modified uh, in accordance with new political demands. Related to all of these was an increase in the scope of the economy, especially the movement of goods and materials. So uh, I'm not going to break that down for you because in many ways it's just sort of bits and pieces of what we've been talking about. All of the these uh, advances uh, and all of the growth in uh, you know, the economy uh, and technology, etc., uh, kind of all coming together and being kind of powerful when combined. Uh, Sargon the Great, oops, I should, Sargon the Great, you see pictured here, created, uh, we, we could say, many scholars do, was the first empire in world history. Since this is the first, again, civilization, the first people to fully go uh, the route of urban agricultural on a large scale. Uh, after the Sumerians did that, Sargon, a little bit further to the north, became so powerful and kind of a separate version of this, uh, he conquered all the others. Uh, and so uh, this was the biggest political structure uh, known at the time, uh, at least that we know of at, at the time, uh, so the first empire. Now, of course, we'll see lots of empires in this class, uh, but this sort of has the, a lot of the attributes of uh, empire. The empires we'll look at that are more famous, like the Roman, uh, uh, you know, later later on. Uh, Sargon had the difficult uh, qu question to answer, how am I going to rule over peoples that are you know, far away from my capital city? Because you have to, you know, they've to take over other regions and sort of take them under your control, you have to govern them. But what do you do if they're far away? Uh, well, there's really really kind of two major options, and we'll see both uh, you know, used by one ruler, one kingdom or another at various times. So either one can work. There are strengths and, and weaknesses, benefits and problems with uh, either one. So, so you can either send out your own governors, that work for you as the king. So Sargon could send out his own governors, and usually it would be somebody that you could trust, or you, th you thought you could trust anyway. So oftentimes family members, a brother, uh, you know, the governor of one province, of, you know, of another brother, a governor of another province you conquered, uh, and a cousin that's uh, you know the, put in charge as governor of a, you know, another kingdom uh, that you brought under your control, or you know people that you've known for a long time, advisors that you really trust, because they're going to be far away from you. Uh, and they could be you know, undermining you without you knowing it. This is before, of course, the days of you know, high-speed travel and airplanes and uh, cars, and no internet. So, so it's harder to keep track of people that were you know, uh, some distance or more away. So people you uh, feel like you can trust. Or what you can do is uh, find a way to make a deal with already existing leaders in the region you just took over, people that are actually from that area who might have hated you, uh, maybe still do, uh, because you came in and conquered them. Uh, but uh, they're nobles, they're powerful, they're rich, they don't want to lose their status in society, so they might be willing to kind of come to terms. Uh, and you give them the power of governor. So you're kind of working for, you know, you're kind of working for Sargon now, working for whoever the emperor is, uh, uh, and uh, but it could be to your benefit. Uh, but there will be blowback, of course, because a lot of your own people, once they find out, will think of you as a traitor. Uh, and so it could be dangerous as well. Uh, so it's hard to know which one uh, to pick if you're the emperor. Sargon actually went with the first choice, uh, put his own sort of people uh, in uh, place as governors. So what's the upside of that? Well, again, you're more likely to be able to trust them. Well, that's not 100% either. The downside uh, is that uh, since they're not you know, since they're seen as foreigners by those that live there, because they are, they're from your society, and now they're sent out to, to govern their society. Uh, and so they're not likely to like it all that much. 
uh, and so there's going to be uh, you know, the potential for uh, more rebellion uh, and in, you know different kinds of uh, pushback against uh, you know your uh, you know, empire ruling over them. On the other side, uh, if you use uh, you know hire make a deal with uh, you know, nobles that are from that culture, uh, the downside is you have less ability to trust them uh, because they are from a different culture. They might turn on you and go back to sort of leading their people against you. Uh, the upside is, of course, it's a bit easier, uh, if not a lot easier, to keep the people that you've just conquered quiet uh, because uh, it, you know, it's, it's one of their own, at least, that's telling them what to do every day. And they may not know that they even know the degree to which you, as the the new their new ruler from a foreign land, is calling the shots and telling that governor exactly what to say and what to do. So uh, again, there's cost and benefits on either side. But the Akkadians under Sargon the Great uh, carved out by brute force uh, the first empire. So uh, an an urban uh, agricultural uh, right agrarian empire that uh, expands outward by military conquest. Another uh, group in the area, they've been around before, but they kind of come into their own. Uh, next uh, are the Assyrians further to the north. Uh, as uh, our lovable textbook author, Professor Perry says, in the 8th and 7th centuries BC, the Assyrians became a ruthless fighting machine that stormed through Babylon, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. Assyrian kings believed that their gods commanded them to conquer and assisted them in their campaigns. That was their belief. Uh, at its height, the Assyrian Empire extended from the Iranian plateau uh, in the east to the Egyptian city of Thebes uh, to the west. So, uh, and you could see in the map on the left, uh, it's a pretty big empire carved out uh, there. Uh, again, if you, uh, geography is not taught very much any longer, uh, sadly, uh, but uh, uh, that's a pretty big chunk of the Middle East uh, and even beyond right, right there. So the Assyrians are another one of these early Mesopotamian uh, you know, agrarian empires, uh, and another one that's carving out an empire after the heyday of the Akkadian Empire, the Assyrians kind of come next. Mesopotamian history is confusing, and very complicated, uh, in ways that I'm not getting into here. You should thank me, buy me a nice Christmas gift later on or something, because it's open to invasion because of its geography, uh, and so it was invaded a lot. And so one group is invading another, even within Mesopotamia, but outsiders that aren't uh, you know, a part of the Mesopotamian kind of Sumerian-based culture are coming in at one time or another. Uh, and so it's hard to kind of keep track of the flow of events and the, and the chronology. This happened and this. For that reason, I'm not taking you really through uh, any kind of detailed chronology other than to say kind of the Sumerians dominated first, uh, then the Akkadians, uh, and then the Assyrians after, after this. The Assyrians imposed a, a rather successful uh, top-down hierarchical rule uh, under the king, who was also the chief priest, uh, high god uh, of one of the most uh, important, if not the most important god. These are polytheistic religious uh, beliefs and systems here, uh, meaning multiple gods. Uh, the rulers slash priests, uh, and that's not uh, unheard of, it's fairly common in the ancient world to see sort of the king uh, also sort of wielding the, uh, the religious power as well. Uh, actually, it's the norm uh, in most places uh, for a long time, collected a tribute, which means a tax of sorts, from nobles uh, who were in turn allowed to live lavishly in their own regions. So nobles can be a problem for kings and emperors because they're already wealthy. They have hereditary wealth, and they're born into it. Uh, their families are used to being rich and powerful because they've got all the connections, have all the perks, all the privileges. Uh, and so they have power and wealth and money and people that are loyal to them average people by the sometimes thousands so uh, and they're often very proud and they're used to wielding power so they don't necessarily want to give up power to a larger uh, you know political unit outside of their own region uh, of the kingdom uh, and so you have to either if you're the king or the emperor to, to subdue them you have to do it by force or you have to make them kind of a deal uh, give them some reason to think you know okay uh, I'll live under this idiot uh, king's uh, you know uh, commands uh, I'll let him make the decisions if I get this or that out of it. Uh, and so one of the deals was, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pay taxes to the king, which is a sign that I'm recognizing his power over me. I wouldn't be paying taxes to him. Uh, and in turn, he'll allow me to kind of do whatever else I want, live as lavishly as I please. 
which actually they're written as written as a nice way to say what the king is saying is as long as you pay taxes to me uh, whatever you do to your peasants living in your area the, the poor people the masses that you have control over uh, I don't care if you're like beating them and punishing them and working them to death to make a lot more money for yourself go ahead as long as you pay your taxes back to me to the king I don't care how you treat the peasants uh, I will look the other way that is what's mainly being said uh, but it's uh, often a good deal uh, for the nobles, and so they uh, they, they take it. Uh, the, the, of course, immorality and all of it, uh, we will leave uh, uh, mentionless because it's obvious, you know, by our standards today. The Assyrian uh, uh, rule uh, from the top down uh, with increasingly effective bureaucracy allowed them to build good roads, good messenger services, uh, large-scale irrigation pro uh, projects, uh, a police force, Really, kind of a secret terror police force you find in kind of modern day totalitarian or authoritarian systems. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it is a sign that the state, the government, is organizing uh, more effectively uh, and sort of, in this case, keeping law and order partly by terror. Uh, there were forced migrations for labor purposes. This isn't uncommon in uh, world, European, other uh, histories uh, where. People are drafted into service, not for military purposes. We know that happens too, but for labor purposes. Uh, so you get a notice in the mail, oh, crap, like jury duty. Oh, crap, I got to show up on this labor labor detail for three months or whatever. Yeah, uh, and sometimes you're sent to a foreign land to cut down trees or whatever it might be. So forced uh, labor uh, and forced you know, migratory uh, labor. Uh, the king, uh, uh, Ashurbanipal, uh, with his huge library of clay tablets uh, was the, the famous king at kind of the height uh, of Assyrian rule. Uh, he had a, a library uh, that was extravagant. All right, you see a, a rendition of it here. Uh, thousands of clay tablets. That means some things inscribed in writing on the clay tablets, which doesn't sound that impressive to us. But keep in mind, almost nobody could read. Uh, right, Almost nobody had any books at all. So thousands of books uh, in a library. And like, you couldn't, like, print things. I mean, it had to be these things that had to be written by hand. So to have thousands of books in a library uh, meant you were either really learned uh, and or really rich and powerful. Uh, and indeed, uh, the Assyrian king here, Ashurbanipal, was. Uh, as uh, Professor Bentley says in his textbook, uh, King Ashurbanipal, whose reign, long reign coincided with the high tide of Assyrian domination, uh, went so far as to style himself not only king of Assyria, but also, grandiosely, king of the universe. <laughs> uh, kings, uh, as you may have noticed uh, in you know, uh, studying history or sort of looking at just the world, uh, I mean, just not just kings, but powerful leaders, can get kind of carried away with themselves, if you haven't noticed. Uh, calling yourself king of the universe and meaning it seriously is, I think, a pretty good sign that you've, uh, you've taken yourself pretty seriously here. Another uh, major uh, important leader here uh, is the uh, king or emperor uh, Tiglath-Pileser III uh, as part of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And um, again, I'm not going to get into the chronology of this. Again, thank me later. But uh, the Assyrians declined in power and then kind of made a comeback. So the Assyrian uh, Empire uh, is the comeback. And the most important powerful king uh, uh, in the comeback is this guy, Tiglath-Pileser. Ian Morris at Stanford, a combination historian and uh, anthropologist who writes really good books, in a fairly recent book says uh, that Tiglath was a, an upstart who usurped the throne. Uh, at first looked uh, like all the other pretenders, uh, yet in less than 20 years, he catapulted Assyria from broken, low-end state to a dynamic high-end one. Low-end means kind of uh, low-tech, you know, broken down, you know, decrepit, no power, little power. Uh, and uh, fixed it all up uh, and converted himself in the process into a great but brutal king. The Assyrians uh, as a whole, both the Neo-Assyrian Empire and the earlier one, were known for mil their military prowess and their kings known for being just brutal in battle, bragging about slaughtering thousands of people, etc. Again, not uncommon in the ancient world, but these guys were particularly uh, adept uh, at uh, wiping out their opponents uh, in battle. Uh, he created a standing army loyal to him, uh, which was something new. Standing army means they're there all the time. 
which isn't the norm either uh, throughout the course of world history. In modern times, it is the norm, but that's fairly recent. Uh, a standing army means you know, your, your army is always, at least in their barracks or their camp or their base, uh, you know, training and preparing, staying in wait in case they're called upon to you know, do something on active duty. Uh, that's not the, the norm. So he was doing something kind of ahead of his time. He enlarged the bureaucracy and improved it, uh, brought in officials loyal to him uh, to uh, you know, rule this uh, kingdom, which you see uh, in the map. It's still fairly large, so the governors are required to be sent out. So he's uh, sending out brothers, or I don't know in his case, whoever it was that he felt he could trust, that he knew. Uh, he broke the power of the nobility. Uh, so, you know, like I said, you have to, if you're the king, the emperor, you must figure out a way to get the nobility uh, to acquiesce to your rule. Uh, you can do it in a number of ways. He did it by going around them in this case as much as possible, uh, using eunuchs uh, as sort of people of importance uh, and put into powerful, powerful positions of administration uh, and governance. A king uh, or an emperor, uh, even this early in the history of agrarian empires, uh, agricultural empires can't do everything himself. They have to delegate authority. I mean, they can't govern the whole region, we know that, but they have to have different kind of sub-departments of government, the treasury and you know, foreign policy and things like this. So they bring in uh, oftentimes powerful, wealthy nobles, but they don't always trust the nobles and for good reason, as we know. So bringing in eunuchs on the part of tiglath Pileser was clever uh, because he's doing an end run around the nobility. And there's at least, there's one reason why you can trust eunuchs. I don't mean you can trust them for everything, but there's at least one way in which they're more trustworthy uh, than uh, others. Do you know what a eunuch is? <laughs> if you don't, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way. Uh, when uh, a man hears what a eunuch is, the kind of natural response is, ouch. Uh, so uh, these are uh, males that have been castrated uh, against their will, of course, uh, though some of them may have, uh, may, uh, you know, sort of willingly go along with it because they might know what's in store for them. Why would a, a king or an emperor have more trust in a eunuch, let's say not nobility, some of them may have been uh, as well, uh, over, uh, you know, nobles, hereditary uh, rich guys? Uh, what's the, why? What would that have to do with anything? Uh, well, one of the reasons that nobility are a f potential threat to kings and emperors is that uh, they they have a hereditary line, uh, right? They usually have kids, and, and, and they want to have sons to pass down their power and their large estate, uh, and their you know their social status uh, to their sons. So if you don't have the equipment to be able to have kids, uh, then you aren't a dynastic threat, You're not a long-term hereditary threat over generations. You could be a threat only with your ability. Uh, as a political leader and skills in that one generation. Uh, you can't pass it on to your sons or offspring because you don't have any. Again, ouch. Uh, well, there, uh, we'll see there are other places that uh, kind of uh, sort of go the eunuch route uh, as well, strange as it sounds to us. Uh, I'm just trying to sh give you a sense of how clever uh, and how uh, sort of diverse the techniques were uh, sort of in these early uh, agricultural empires uh, in terms of acquiring power uh, and making sort of these systems work to the king's advantage, but sometimes it ended up being to the advantage of the people as well, not necessarily the eunuchs, but uh, in the sense of creating stability and law and order, uh, etc. Uh, you know, uh, improved standard of living uh, is often going hand in hand uh, with these advances, however cruel and violent they are. Uh, both uh, you know, uh, domestically and in foreign policy warfare. Uh, client governors in conquered areas, unless they were disloyal. So this guy tried it the other way uh, and uh, tried to make deals with people who were you know, indigenous to the region uh, that uh, Tiglath and the Assyrians had just conquered. Uh, regular taxes uh, and a tax system, not uh, the traditional shakedown that was the way it happened before. Before the tax collection was looked more like kind of armed robbery uh, than anything else. Uh, but uh, this uh, uh, system, uh, the Neo-Assyrian Empire, the tiglath pileser is kind of the ultimate example, uh, is sort of uh, making uh, taxes uh, sort of more a regular uh, and normalized part, more organized part of uh, sort of the way the, 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 the kingdom worked. Uh, 
Uh, and one of the lessons from this, uh, coming from Professor Morris, who I quoted above, uh, and he says quite succinctly, of course, it was centralize or perish, meaning all this stuff they're doing to uh, centralize means to bring you know power together, uh, you know sort of power in one person or one government's hands, taking it away from nobles, uh, right, and centralizing in the power of the uh, of the king and emperor, so tight control over sort of your uh, area. Uh, centralize or perish once again uh, is a reference to cultural evolution. Uh, right? Centralize or perish, uh, or it means you better evolve. Uh, you better uh, have the improved military technology, the improved uh, agricultural techniques, the improved uh, you know technology, uh, or else your neighbors will get it uh, and they're going to attack and conquer you. So uh, you better be good uh, and continue to improve at all these aspects of civilization and agrarian empire, uh, or you're likely to go under. Then comes the Neo-Babylonian or Chaldean empires, it's sometimes called. So again, in another group, I'm kind of uh, coming in and kind of becoming the dominant one in the region. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, flourished after the kind of original Babylonian uh, per period of dominance. Uh, Professor Perry says the destruction of the Assyrian Empire made possible the rise of the Chaldean uh, under Nebuchadnezzar, again, the most famous uh, of the Neo-Babylonian uh, uh, Chaldean uh, leaders, the empire reached its height. A talented general and statesman and a brilliant administrator, Nebuchadnezzar had Babylon rebuilt. The new Babylon had magnificent palaces and temples. Of course, on the right, uh, what are known famously as the Hanging Gardens of Babylon are depicted uh, in a painting and a picture. We can't know for sure if it looked exactly like that, but it probably did. So, uh, and this, of course, uh, would have been uh, uh, eye-popping to anybody who saw it for the first time. That's not just a display of beauty, although it's that too. It's also a display of wealth and power. Someone who saw that wouldn't, you know, the point wouldn't be lost on them. It wouldn't take them long to think, you know, actually think in their mind, hmm, this guy must be super rich and super powerful because look at that. Uh, you know, that's, ex that's extraordinary. Uh, and, of course, that's part of the reason that these kind of things are built. I mean, the, the emperors often like the beauty, and you know, as well, but uh, they're also sending a message uh, that's that's received loud and clear. Getting back to some sort of just general uh, features of Mesopotamian society before we finish this, uh, we need to note that religion uh, was the foundation of Mesopotamian society and culture. Uh, and this is true basically of all the ancient societies we're going to look at in one way or another. Uh, but since this is the first uh, agrarian empire that we cover, uh, it's important to sort of see the centrality of religion here and now. Everything uh, uh, thought to be ex uh, everything was thought to be explained by the gods. Whether something good happened or bad happened, it was something that the gods had done. No decisions made without consulting the will of the gods first in all kinds of different uh, you know, diverse uh, ceremonies uh, and rituals and rites done by priests uh, to sort of uh, figure out the will of the gods uh, and uh, try to predict uh, uh, what is going to happen, what we need to do, uh, sacrificing animals, interpreting uh, their entrails, you know, like you look at their you know, their guts uh, to read kind of the future. What? Why would they do that? Well, you know, we have things like it that we still see that are the same thing. Uh, right, uh, reading the lines in the palm of your hand. Uh, there are some people right now that think, well, what's wrong with that? Well, it makes sense to me. Okay, well then, fair enough. But but then why would interpreting uh, the way some animals' intestines look uh, be any different? Uh, who knows? Uh, so uh, they're looking for signs uh, from the gods. Again, why animals' entrails? Uh, good question. Uh, but uh, gods. Uh, were uh, sort of seen to then explain everything. Uh, the myths uh, about gods, uh, stories about them, uh, were used to explain the origins uh, of you know their people and their you know their society, their world. Uh, people were here, at least the way it was believed uh, and taught, uh, here to carry out the will of the gods. Uh, so these are sort of deeply religious societies. We think. The evidence is, is, is pretty strong. But keep in mind, uh, on this one, uh, it gets a little dicey because 
the written records we have from Mesopotamia. These are part, I, I left this out until now. Uh, it's important that I remember this, and I finally just did. Uh, but uh, these are societies that do have the written word, uh, which is another sort of defining feature of uh, um, you know, civilization or uh, you know, the urban agricultural. Uh, so, uh, the, but hardly anyone can write. And this will be true in Egypt, uh, another similar uh, early agrarian uh, agricultural empires as well. Why? Because it's so damned hard. Uh, they didn't have the alphabet, uh, so they had thousands of different, different symbols, pictographs usually, not phonetic uh, letters, but pictographs, uh, so that uh, to, to become literate, you had to memorize thousands and thousands and thousands of you know, words uh, uh, to be able to read and write. So only a tiny few uh, uh, could do it and got to do it. Well, who got to do it? Rich people, you know, sons of uh, nobility, kings, or sometimes daughters and wives of, of kings who ran the temple complexes. You see a temple or ziggurat on the upper right there. Uh, there were cases where women, but they were rich women, uh, uh, coming from you know the nobility or royal families uh, who uh, were uh, you know the people in charge of uh, these kind of temples. Uh, so uh, it's a tiny fraction of the population that you know makes important decisions, and it's a, a tinier fraction because women didn't usually have the access to education, even the rich, powerful ones uh, who are literate. Uh, so this then skews the primary source documents to some degree uh, in favor of right what the i mean it, it does uh what the nobles and powerful rich and powerful are thinking there aren't too many documents from peasants because they weren't literate uh and so if we're just reading documents because that's all that exists from rich people uh how do we know that they're right that the whole society is deeply religious there's we run into the problem we don't entirely although i think from what we know about uh, peoples going back thousands and hundreds of years worldwide, that it's pretty safe to conclude that uh, they were deeply religious. Uh, and religion is incredibly, and th this is a point I'm making in kind of offhanded way, but let's slow down here. This is an incredibly important point, and it will be repeated going forward in other units. Religion, uh, among other things, I'm not saying it's the only uh, reason for religion, uh, especially from a personal individual level, but uh, from a social perspective, Religion, uh, it can be seen as sort of super glue. Uh, and so societies, as we know from our previous unit, uh, part of the way they stay together is through stories, and particularly through religious stories. Uh, and if everybody believes them, or at least adheres to them, uh, it's a, a great way to keep a society together, keep them kind of all on the same page, adhering to the same value system, uh, obeying the same laws, and doing so willingly. So uh, they people tended to believe, and they tended to, I think, be uh, take comfort uh, in not just the religious stories themselves, but comfort in knowing uh, that the religion sort of had a way of sort of drawing them together, uh, making them feel uh, like they were together. Daniel Chereau, uh, in a great uh, uh, little book called How Societies Change, which is hilarious because it's a really good book, uh, fairly recently written, uh, but uh, tackling that question, how societies change, is, is a, you know, an extremely difficult one, and he does it like in 150, 180 pages. Uh, uh, it's incredible how well he does it, considering that's pretty thin uh, for that big of a question. Uh, it, it's a, a, it, the book is about exactly what it says, uh, and it's a, it's a really interesting read for anyone that's interested in the development of human uh, societies and cultures. He says it's not surprising that the earliest states we know about in Sumeria, right, the Sumerians, the first uh, civilization, consisted of cities made up of granaries, temples, and the, fort uh, the fortifications built around them for protection. The mediator shaman, priests, began to build temples from which they exercised their profession and power, and they needed granaries in order to store the tribute they took from the people to pay uh, them for their efforts. Uh, their allies, the soldiers, who were becoming professional war makers, right, everybody's specializing now, also benefited from this tribute. They manned the walls that protected the temple storehouses, they enforced the decisions of the priests, and they fought neighboring states competing for the same resources. The first rulers were priest-warrior kings. 
So he's showing that there was a connection between uh, you know, uh, elite priests, elite warrior, and elite king. Sometimes they were one and the same, uh, three functions sort of in one guy. So if you were all of those, uh, you're a powerful sort indeed. Now we get some of the literature, some of the famous written work uh, of the period, primary source documents, of course. Uh, the two we're going to look at are uh, extremely famous. There are others as well, by the way. Uh, you see on the left a chunk of stone that was found. I forget when where it was found, uh, excavated uh, and interpreted, uh, translated uh, from uh, sort of uh, you know, original uh, language. Uh, and, and sort of we now know this was a, a story, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's called, who was a king uh, in Mesopotamia. Uh, only the gods live forever. In the story here, we don't know if there's any truth to the story, if it was just a you know fictional one, though this was based on, again, a, a, an actual king, at least the, the name. Uh, so uh, the king travels in the story beyond this world in search of immortality. Uh, and it, it's because he loses a friend, a friend of his, a close friend dies, and it sends him kind of uh, into this uh, uh, metaphysical quest for immortality. And in a sense, he's, you know, he's struggling, and he's going through a, a difficult, uh, you know, time psychologically with the loss of his friend, uh, and he's kind of contemplating sort of existence. Why? You know, why do people die? What, you know, why does it have to happen? Why do we live? Why do we die? So he's asking sort of the some of the big questions in life that you know many of us uh, get to at one point or another or have forced on us at one point or another uh and so he does it uh, he, he sort of in a sense copes with this by trying to search for uh, life after death eternal life uh but he doesn't find it in the end uh, uh he goes sort of far and wide in a story again through the series of stories and myths uh that became famous you know at the time so this is one of the ways that Mesopotamians, sort of, at least those that had access to this, uh, sort of processed, uh, you know, their place in the world, uh, living within uh, Mesopotamian uh, culture, uh, with the Mesopotamian world here. But maybe most important for our purposes is that this famous primary source document uh, that is uh, that actually exists in a couple of different uh, forms. Now, this isn't the only copy of it. It's funny to call that a copy of something, but uh, it was. It. it uh, is a great primary source document in sort of telling us a lot about the beliefs and values uh, and ways uh, of the Mesopotamians. For instance, as it says on the screen, we can see uh, from this story and in other places as well that they had a very pessimistic, anxious uh, outlook on life, worldview. Worldview is a catch-all term for a people's uh, um, values, attitudes, beliefs, uh, it's, etc. So uh, their view of the world was particularly pessimistic. Uh, and, and it comes, uh, you know, just the overall story that I just told you, uh, the general uh, drift of it, right, that he searches for immortality and doesn't find it. Uh, that's, per, that's kind of a downer. Not exactly the uplifting ending to this. It's not a happy ending, uh, right? That's a, that's a depressing ending. Uh, so this is uh, one uh, piece of evidence uh, that they had a, a, an anxious, pessimistic worldview. The question would be why, and that's not answered in the epic, um, but uh, historians usually point to two things about Mesopotamia. One, uh, we've already talked about, uh, that it's sort of geographic openness to invasion. Uh, and because it was open invasion, it got invaded a lot uh, and overrun here and there. So if you lived in Mesopotamia, especially as an average person, peasant farmer, say, uh, and you're getting invaded every other week by some new... Uh, you know, foreign group you'd never heard of before and they're burning down your farm and you rebuild it and you get attacked in by another group in the other direction. They do the same. You, know, you probably don't have the most optimistic, you know, view uh, of life and the world. So uh, that's one of the explanations that historians have given. Another one uh, is uncertainty and unpredictability with regard to the uh, uh, river, uh, uh, rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, the big rivers, some of maybe their uh, tributaries. The rivers flooded very unpredictably. Uh, we'll see in Egypt, the Nile, the basis of their civilization, uh, the ancient world, the Nile uh, overflow, overflowed regularly, uh, but the, the, word, the key word there is regularly, right? Uh, so 
the Egyptians could predict accurately when the Nile was going to overthrow, uh, overflow and flood and prepare accordingly and sort of, you know, actually use it to their benefit. But that wasn't true of the Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, they just sort of you know, overflowed, uh, flooded, uh, you know, when it was least expected. Uh, and so this, I think, one could see, uh, could also, you know, if you, especially if you're a farmer, uh, get invaded uh, uh, one year, the next year there's uh, terrible floods that ruin your whole farm. Great, I rebuild it again. Uh, so uh, this, uh, you know, those two things are maybe the two main reasons, as far as we know, can tell, uh, that the worldview was so pessimistic, uh, the Mesopotamians. So world unpredictable, the world unpredictable, gods were unpredictable as well, not surprisingly. Right? If your world is unpredictable, uh, and then you have a, a belief system, religious system with multiple gods, polytheistic system, the likelihood is that you're going to see the gods as erratic, uh, uh, you know, as, because life is so unpredictable as well. The other document or piece of writing that's famous, that also is a tremendous, has been for a long time, primary source document uh, that's given up a great deal of uh, information, uh, given us lots of knowledge about the Mesopotamians, is the Code of Hammurabi, uh, which wasn't a piece of literature, uh, but a written law code. Uh, there actually were others as well, not as famous, it's are, are extant, but this is the big one uh, and the one that's sort of gotten the most attention, uh, maybe the most, uh, the one that's told us the most. So what does it tell us about Mesopotamian society? Let's get to that, but first I'm going to read uh, from Elman Services classic work one more time. Politically, the significance of the writing of law codes must have been of tremendous importance. Establishing a uniform system of royal justice throughout the realm, the kingdom, brought these representatives of the imperial court into direct contact with the affairs of local persons and groups, and in time made the bureaucracy, in front of the organizational structure of government, ever more useful and necessary. So actually, a written law code, whatever it says, you know, goes kind of hand in hand uh, with systematizing uh, and better organizing governments and government agencies uh, and bureaucracy and making them more uh, efficient over time. Uh, even if the law code is unjust, as this one is, by our standards anyway, uh, it's probably still better to have a written law code than not have one at all. Uh, so this is sort of a step forward, certainly in terms of organization, and the ability to kind of keep sort of everyone on the same page together, in this case, by you know, providing them access to the written law. Here it is, and here's how you're going to obey the law, or else. Uh, but you can see, whether fair or unfair, uh, how uh, much power that has in bringing people together uh, in kind of a, a stable law and order way. Uh, women were subordinated uh, under the law, but protected under the law. So, uh, two feminists today, both of those uh, would be, or, or are, uh, uh, sort of reprehensible. Uh, but uh, at least they were protected. At least there was some concern for the plight of women. Uh, so, uh, of course, women today would say, understandably, uh, rightfully, uh, that we don't need to be protected. We don't have extra protections, just the same protections as everybody else. Uh, right? By giving women extra protection under the law, uh, you're implying that women uh, are, are somehow inferior, can't sort of make it uh, do things on their own. But that, again, can cut both ways. Uh, because uh, uh, certainly women were subordinated under the law and by the, the culture and customs uh, in a male-dominated society. So the fact they had some protections of the law uh, certainly uh, kept uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, more major potential harms from happening to them. It didn't necessarily stop them, but it, you know, uh, it was an incentive or disincentive. Punishments were harsh under the Code of Hammurabi, at least by our standards today. They weren't harsh by the standards of the time at all. Uh, uh, an area where presentism kind of becomes an issue, and it's hard to know what to make of, of all this because of the passage of time uh, and what was going on around in other studies which had punishments and law codes equally as harsh. Also, and these are all things that stand out to students uh, when you assign this, and we'll read a, a segment of this, or you are already, depending on where you are. Uh, but uh, there was class bias written into the law. Uh, so uh, that meaning that rich people, powerful people, uh, had uh, uh, you know, a, a better shake 
uh, from the authorities, from the judges, uh, from the legal system. You think, well, how is that different than now? Which is a good point. Uh, well, there, but there is a big difference. In our case, we know, uh, right, to be realistic, we know that the law doesn't treat everybody equally all the time. Uh, and not just based on uh, differences of wealth, but based on race and ethnicity and religion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the law itself does require equality. So the principle uh, is equality, uh, or sort of equal treatment of the laws uh, for everybody uh, in our system. It just doesn't always work out the way in practice. What we're saying is that in ancient Mesopotamia, it was written into the law that it was supposed to be unfairly skewed in favor of the rich and powerful. They actually wrote it right in there. You might say, well, at least they were honest about it. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, but I think uh, we in our society today, uh, I think, tend to underestimate the value of principles uh, and ideals. Uh, even if they're not, I, I mean, an ideal by definition is something to shoot for, not something that's totally real or, you know, uh, works out that way 100% of the time. But having the ideals there in the first place uh, and the principles there in the first place, I think are extremely important. Uh, uh, even if, the, to, to, to just say, well, we're not living up to the the system, uh, you know, the, the legal code, uh, its ideals and principles, so let's just get rid of them. I think that's not the, the proper analysis. The, the idea is we have to come around to uh, uh, find better ways to carry out uh, and sort of adhere to our principles, uh, get better uh, at making sure more, uh, maybe everyone eventually, uh, uh, sort of is treated equally under the law as a principle. Uh, uh, so, uh, but those are the three things I think that sort of really uh, stand out when people uh, read uh, excerpts from the Code of Hammurabi. Women subordinated uh, under the law. The punishments were very harsh by our standards. Uh, there was class bias uh, written right into the law. It wasn't even supposed to be equal, uh, let alone you know, actually ending up being equal. Uh, this was definitely an early effort at rationalizing the law, meaning, uh, again, making it more systematic and more understandable. So in that sense, again, it was a step up uh, because people, or at least anybody that was near one of these sort of stone copies of it or had somebody that you know had read it, knew about it, and that happened, uh, would have at least an idea of where they stood. Even if the, I, if the laws were unfair, it still could help. That, Oops, okay, I, I can't do this any longer. I didn't realize it was illegal. Okay, I think I'll stay away from that. Since you might also know that the punishments are very harsh, uh, even for things that we would consider to be minor uh, uh, crimes or infractions today. Uh, there are about 282 uh, laws uh, divided into different sections. Even the fact that they divided this into different sections uh, was a step forward. That sounds sort of you know, rudimentary uh, and basic to us today, but uh, it was sort of an advance. Uh, this was you know, put in sections intentionally for better understanding, in a sense, for you know, easier access. Uh, so the Code of Hammurabi was a written code. Hammurabi was an actual king, uh, in a Babylonian king, uh, in the years that you see there. Uh, and uh, he probably didn't write the law code himself, uh, but his you know, judges and lawyers and uh, scholars, uh, uh, you know, civil servants did it for him. Uh, but uh, this, uh, m most importantly for us, uh, it's a gold mine uh, primary source document. Uh, why? Because laws, right, legal systems, and when anything is sort of written down about a legal system, uh, give you an immense amount of knowledge about the whole society and culture. Uh, think about our uh, justice system today. Uh, from the Supreme Court level uh, on down, right? Judges and, uh, and the courts hear cases about everything, about religion, about the economy, about politics. About the, so uh, if you just study the law, the written law of any time and place in history, uh, you're going to get a lot of knowledge, not just about the law, but about all the uh, areas that the law intersects with, which is basically everything in society. So the Code of Hammurabi uh, is extremely important uh, in understanding, uh, has been important uh, in interpreting what uh, was happening and sort of how and why in Mesopotamian uh, uh, you know, ancient society. Lastly, Mesopotamian culture, all kinds of cultural strides made here. In this case, we're talking about culture in the, the more restricted uh, sense of its meaning and definition. The broad uh, sense of culture we've already talked about, which are kind of rules uh, right, kind of recipes, blueprints uh, for how to behave and what to do and not to do uh, in any given culture. 
uh, but culture in the more specific sense uh, is sort of a, a creative uh, art uh, and scholarship. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this is what we're talking about here as culture. Uh, the Mesopotamians made uh, great strides in math, uh, multiplication, multiplica multiplication. I can't say it. I haven't been drinking really. I, I mean it. Uh, the uh, division tables, some basic geometry, uh, advances in astronomy. They observed the movements of planets. Uh, it's pretty long ago to be doing that already. They developed a lunar calendar, uh, not to understand uh, the cause and effect and uh, chronology, uh, but to understand the will of the gods. Uh, so uh, this is a, an important lesson for us because we'll see it again. Uh, but there are a lot of things that happen uh, that uh, in history that can be put under the category that you should already know about the unintended consequences of history. You should already know because it's in the introductory lecture. Uh, so, uh, right, uh, and this is a good example of it. There are many. This is a good example to start with. So the reason, the first reason that such people, the Mesopotamians and many others around the world, started to look towards the heavens and try to you know, uh, note the movements uh, of uh, planets and stars. They didn't know what it was uh, per se, or at least not like we do, but they could sort of measure it and see it and see that it changed from time to time. Uh, but they were using it kind of like they used the entrails of animals to kind of predict the future, understand the will of the gods. Uh, but the very fact that they were then acquiring information and knowledge about the heavens and the stars and sort of how they how it changed and how they moved uh, was sort of a... a, a a step along the way uh, toward what eventually became astronomy and science. It wasn't astronomy and science at the time per se, because they weren't trying to find out for you know scientific reasons. Uh, they were trying to understand the will of the gods. Nonetheless, it led them in the direction of scientific discovery uh, of uh, uh, you know th things that we now call astronomy. It was a great example of uh, unintended consequences. Uh, so without that, who knows uh, you know, how much slower uh, they would have been, we would have been uh, in sort of trying to uh, uh, you know, get at scientific understanding uh, of astronomy, the universe, the solar system, the planets, the stars, the sun, etc. Medicine. Uh, they tried to identify illnesses. Sounds funny, uh, but uh, it hadn't really been thought of that much before. To sort of, okay, this is that illness, and this is a different one here, and here are the symptoms of this one, and here are the symptoms of that one. And so they started to kind of catalog uh, and identify uh, uh, these kind of uh, things. It's pretty basic, but you can't go much further uh, until you understand uh, that you have to do those kind of things uh, and, and sort of get it down uh, you know, pretty carefully uh, and uh, you know, clearly. Uh, they were trying to find appropriate remedies uh, you know, for specific, okay, this illness uh, might require this remedy, but that remedy, this other, the same remedy doesn't work for that illness over there. Uh, again, just un, you know, unbelievably basic to us, but we're talking about thousands of years ago. So uh, again, important to rationally distinguish between this disease and illness and that, if you can, uh, and distinguish between uh, appropriate uh, remedies uh, if and when you can find them. Now, from our perspective today, uh, medicine was in a you know terrible state indeed because uh, uh, they didn't know you know compared to us anything uh, but uh, the point is that they're starting at all and in fact I want to make one further point we went back to, or going back to the code of Hammurabi and I pointed out the things that stand out from my experience with students uh, understandably when they read uh, uh, passages from the code of Hammurabi uh, that women were subordinate to men under the law, uh, punishments were harsh, and there was a clear class bias written into the laws. So the question to me uh, is, and this you might, if you haven't already, talk about, uh, you know, do the homework. Is it more important to know all the ways in which, by our standards, this system of law was unfair and unjust and cruel and harsh? Or is it more important for us to sort of see in which ways they were lay, laying down certain features of law that have continued uh, and sort of were the building blocks and the foundations for uh, the positive necessary aspects of uh, law, at least if it's going to be just and fair. Uh, I, I don't think there's a, an, uh, an absolute answer to that question, but I would say, at least as a teacher, uh, uh, and really even beyond that, 
uh, that it's actually, maybe it's important to know both, but I think it's more important to know uh, and to understand the ways in which this sort of started the process, moved uh, however slowly, uh, however much, it was a tiny step, but in the direction of justice as we know it, at least expect it in our society and legal systems today. All right, uh, uh, take care, thank you.